Pete Daniel is president of the Southern Historical Association. He's president-elect of the Organization of American Historians. Uh, his research and writing encompass a broad sweep of history and culture, including agriculture, and rural history, and all its human, animal, biological, chemical, and mechanical dimensions, natural disasters, popular culture, including but not limited to music and sports, uh, including sports cars, the formation of public policy at both the national and local levels, race relations, and the struggles of disadvantage for social justice. Pete also has abiding interest in documentary photography and the presentation of historical material in public venues such as museums. He's also uh, gone out of his way to help and support numerous undergraduate and graduate students now fanned out all over the world. Having grown up in a North Carolina farming family and having spent years interpreting history and its artifacts for the general public because of his experience as curator for the National Museum of American History, Pete Daniel brings a unique perspective to the study of history. Uh, he is the premier historian of the 20th century American South. No scholar has done more different topics and done them so well in so many award-winning books than Pete Daniel. His long-standing interest in photography has led to production of three important books. He writes engagingly, wittingly, and succinctly about all kinds of matters, from the complicated process of growing and harvesting flu-cured tobacco to arcane process of restoring a 1903 Hart Par No. 3 tractor now displayed in nearby Penfield, Illinois, which I recommend you go see. Daniel's classic Shadow of Slavery, Peonage in the South, 1901-1969, the first book that I assigned ever to be taught in a class here in 1974, provides an unsurpassed explanation of how planters retain control over African-American laborers after emancipation. Deepen as they come, a study of the 1927 flood in the Mississippi River pioneered the use of documentary photographs in historical studies and one of, one of the first works in the new genre of ecological history. As a consequence of this publication, you can imagine that Pete has been interviewed repeatedly during the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Uh, Pete's award-winning book, Breaking the Land, studied the transformation of rice, tobacco, and cotton cultures, a true comparative study in the first half of the 20th century, and it's one of the most important books in American rural and southern history. As all of Pete's work does, it understands that agricultural history is necessarily cultural history and attends with exceptional care and respect to the voices and practices of the farmers who created and sustained these changing cultures. Lost Revolutions, one of my favorite books of all time, is equally groundbreaking because of its attention to the 1950s, a time and cultural moment too long ignored in studies of the American South. In chapters that range over a variety of practices in what Pete has termed low-down culture, uh, that is, the lives of poor white and black Southerners, the book convincingly argues that the decade entailed a series of missed opportunities to overthrow patriarchal segregation of practices and institutions. You're going to hear from his new book, Toxic Drift, Pesticides and Health in the Post-World War II South, which are the result of the single most prestigious lecture series, the Fleming se Series in Southern History, and here, Pete returns to his interest in ecological history. His current research that he's working on now represents a return to an interest he wrote about in the legal basis of agrarian capitalism, a prize-winning, much-studied essay analyzing the, the impact of New Deal legislation on sharecroppers and small farmers uh, as this legislation was enacted by local communities, through, communities throughout the South, and particularly what happened to the black farmer for those of you interested in documentary photography, Pete has sort of also pioneered in using that. I can run on and on, but I think I better stop because he only has five more minutes to do his lecture now. Uh, so as I see my wife waving for me to shut up, I think I will. I do want you to know that I study community. And in 1988-89, we packed up and went to Washington, D.C. with all five children. Uh, where I was at the Wilson Center, uh, in fact, uh, where Pete had been a few years before. And it was in the old Smithsonian Castle building, uh, part of the Smithsonian. Uh, Pete not only went out of his way to make me as a transplanted Southerner, but my whole family feel welcome. And while there, I noticed that Pete Daniel not only writes about community, 
but he knows how to create one. He did more to create a community among a diverse group of scholars and students than anyone I know. So I want to introduce you to the nicest person in the history profession and not a bad scholar either, Pete Daniel. He leaves me speechless. Kids playing hide and seek in, DD, in a DD cloud uh, behind a, a truck is one of the most enduring and haunting images from the 1950s. For rural folks, dive bombing crop dusters, trailing mist were probably more common. Either image epitomizes the conventional wisdom that pesticides we buy off the shelf or use in agriculture are benign. Post-World War II advertising portrayed synthetic pesticides as miracle chemicals that would purge urban and rural America of insects and weeds. Yet practically no testing had been done for environmental impact or on the short or long-term health effects of these chemicals. Today I'll mention only two groups of these chemicals, chlorinated hydrocarbons such as DDT and endrin, and organophosphates such as malathion and parathion. To control and test toxicity levels, the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Agriculture Research Service, which we'll abbreviate AARS, handled labeling, mounted control programs for gypsy moths, bark beetles, and fire ants, and investigated abuses, at least theoretically. In, the in 1970, the Environmental Protection Agency took over pesticide issues in no small part because the ARS had failed so miserably to do its job. While many people tolerated pesticide exposure, others were not so fortunate, either because they were naturally more susceptible or because they got higher doses. Some people suffered severe health problems. Fish and wildlife had even more severe problems with chemicals. Those who produced chemicals were reluctant to admit problems, but people who observed dead fish, birds, and other wildlife, and who saw neighbors or friends sickened, began to doubt industry and government safety claims. By the early 1960s, many people were confused with the gap between benign advertisements and reality. It was at this juncture that Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring and its popularity rested primarily upon its intelligent discussion of the pesticide issue. Until I worked on two exhibits that dealt with pesticide use, I mouthed the conventional wisdom, duh. These are two pelican eggs that are in the exhibit Science in American Life. The one on your right was from the time in the 50s when pesticides that birds became exposed to, it weakened the shells, and when the birds, when the, these big predators sat on their nest, the, the eggs collapsed, and therefore you had no, uh, they could not reproduce, and we lost a lot of uh, our, wild, our animals that way, especially the birds. By the time Science in American Life opened in 1994, I had learned that chemicals left a grim legacy. Yet chemical companies remained desperate to refute any hint that chemicals used in yards, in homes, or in agriculture were toxic. Additional research appeared in agricultural history. I did an article on fire ants, and also in a chapter in Lost Revolutions. Faced with preparing the Walter, Fle Walter Linwood Fleming lectures for 2004, this LSU series, I again turned to the papers of the Agricultural Research Service at the National Archives. I came across a telegram from the Delta Council's B.F. Smith asking that Dr. Marvin Merkel, who was a scientist at the Stoneville Experiment Station in Mississippi and also a consultant for Shell Chemical, that he serve as a consultant in a pesticide case in Sunflower County, Mississippi. Something in the telegram and the surrounding correspondence piqued my interest and set in motion an interesting research odyssey. I first read the reported case, Lawler v. Skelton, at the Library of Congress Law Library. Then I traveled to Jackson, Mississippi to read the three-volume trial transcript at the Mississippi State Archives. I interviewed participants, discovered the plaintiff's attorney's files, 
and called Lawlers, the man's name was Charles Lawler, I called the Lawlers all over Mississippi, Arkansas, and Tennessee trying to find relatives who could furnish pictures, and I had no luck. Nobody seemed to know this, this man. Uh, so I, I left to give the Fleming Lectures in April of 2004, uh, drove down to Baton Rouge with the draft of the book and the three Walter Linwood Fleming Lectures, and I stopped off in Memphis to visit friends. My, my friend Jim Lanier, who teaches at Rhodes College, drove me over to the Velsicol plant, which was alarmingly close to Rhodes College where he taught, which he didn't realize, and we... Uh, found the plant and here's a little closer up you notice there's a heart on the stack I don't know what the symbolism of that is it's, it's almost cruel irony or something but in, in 1964 the this plant was dumping so much endrin into the to the creek Cypress Creek and then into the Wolf River and then into the Mississippi River that there were massive fish kills all down the Mississippi River Millions of fish were dying. Ducks were falling out of the sky from having ingested endrin. It was a wildlife disaster. They also dumped their, um, this is the, a couple of the outlet pictures. These pictures are in the National Archives. This is from the Hollywood dump where they were dumping big drums of chemicals that were, they did test on them, they were pure chlorinated hydrocarbons. The Hollywood dump flooded and it rose up and went into the Wolf River and then into the Mississippi River. So it, it, all these chemicals were polluting the Mississippi River. They also vented chlorine gas occasionally and that, that brought lawsuits from people who were harmed by that. They were, they were not a good citizen, citizen. There's an incredible clipping file in the Memphis Public Library that contains a lot of this from newspaper accounts. So anyway, I, I wanted to see that because that's part of the, the, the study I was doing. And that evening, Jim Lanier invited friends for dinner, <clears throat> including my good friend David Less, one of the key people who helped in this exhibit I did in Memphis, Rock and Soul Social Crossroads. And David is a musicologist and a wonderful guy, and so he came to the dinner and brought his wife, Angela, and their daughter, Emma. So we were, we were eating, and Angela will talk about family. She's from Arkansas. And she was explaining how that their daughter, whose name was Emma McGuire-Less, was almost named Emma Lawler-Less. And I thought I'd misheard her and asked her to repeat that. And she said, Lawler. And I said, well, Angela, you know the person is the main character that's carrying these lectures was Charles Lawler. He was this man who was poisoned in Mississippi. And Angela got this look on her face, this sort of like, Oh, yeah, Uncle Charlie, he was poisoned. <laughs> so so the, the odds of that are remarkable, but, it, but within a short time, I was in contact with the family, and, and the photographs you'll see of, of Charles Lawler and family uh, came from that just most strange thing. The Lawler case resonates with many themes that emerged in my research and writing about pesticides in the quarter century after World War II. And I want to talk about it because it epitomizes a lot of the issues that, that came up in the book. On the morning of August 16, 1956, the people around the Marie Gin and the cotton field surrounding it were routinely going about their work. And here at the, the bottom yellow part is Indianola, and up at the top is the Marie area in Sunflower County, Mississippi. V.A. Johnson owned the gin and the surrounding fields. And the day before, he had consulted with his tenant, Tracy Skelton, and they decided to spray for boll weevils. About 9 o'clock on the morning of the 16th, Skelton found the gin manager, Charles Lawler, welding steel supports on a freshly poured concrete slab behind the gin and told him that a crop duster would be spraying that morning. Lawler insisted that Skelton delay the spray, spraying until he finished the welding. He couldn't stop the, the process right then. Later, uh, later, Lawler heard the plane in the distance and assumed that it wouldn't spray near the gin until he was finished. Johnny Martin, flying the Turk Dusting Company uh, plane, was on the last of three flights that morning when he decided to spray the field beside the, the gin. 
uh, that's Charles Lawler. And so Martin approached silently because he'd cut back on power and he had to dodge some, some lines and barely miss the gin. And then he came in right over the slab where Charles Lawler was welding and, and turned on the spray. And here's a diagram of the, you can see it. Um, the plane's path is this way. And Lawler was on that platform right there. So the plane had to navigate a, a ditch, some, some lines, the gin shed, and, and the pilot, I, I don't think, ever saw anybody. He was concentrating totally on, on what he was doing. And nobody told him he not to spray there. So he came over and he, he sprayed, and the, there was an African-American man working with Lawler who saw the plane at the last minute and war, hollered to Mr. Lawler, who was, was on his hands and knees welding with his welding mask on. He, he, didn't mo he couldn't move before the garlic-smelling insecticide swept over him. And then he had uh, Johnny McCaleb, the black man, help rub the thing off. But, but Lawler couldn't get his breath. He, he, it took him a while to ever start breathing again. He went home. He had a little lunch. He said he could, continued to taste pesticides. He went back to work that afternoon. He felt miserable. He spent a restless night uh, uh, throwing up, twitching muscles. Went back to the gym the next morning, went home lay down and went into a coma. It turned out that uh, he'd been sprayed with a combination of malathion, which is an organophosphate, a nerve gas, and endrin, which is a chlorinated hydrocarbon, and of course there were solvents also mixed in, xylene and an unknown solvent in one of the other uh, mixtures. Uh, Dr. A.A. A. Aiden came out to Lawler's house and sent him immediately to, immediately to the hospital. Now, while this mixture had the potential for mischief, most people who were sprayed, and a lot of people were accidentally, or people who were the, the, the field markers who, who stood at the end of the row and moved down so much every time the crop duster could keep up with how far he'd sprayed, a lot of people were sprayed and suffered no ill effects. We may as well look at some evidence here. <laughs> These are the labels that were in the files, in the trial files. This is the malathion and the endrin. And why they don't have skull and crossbones on the, the malathion is beyond me. It's an absolute nerve gas. And you need both that and an antidote, otherwise you could get into more serious trouble. As you can see from this duster photograph, the spray, pattern, the spray pattern was not symmetrical. Rather, the propeller and air circulation around the wing swirled chemicals. The spray rained down on Lawler, his shirt was soaked, hit the concrete, and then swirled under his welding hood. No doubt he inhaled it, and it entered his lungs. And from that moment until the end of his life, Lawler never regained his health. And he had to use oxygen to breathe, he had dizzy spells, he cried easily, and he spent much of his time in bed. He was a skilled workman who constructed cotton gins in the off-season. He was an active man who climbed to the rafters in his gin work. He was a good family provider. And then he lost his job at the Marie Gin, and ultimately the family broke up and he was forced to live with uh, one of his uh, sons. In August 1957, Charles Lawler sought treatment from Dr. Mary Elizabeth Hogan. Uh, she had a clinic in Glen Allen, Mississippi, where she became widely recognized for her selfless practice among the black population around Lake Washington. She cared for patients, dispensed drugs, and was often paid, if at all, with chickens or eggs. Her one extravagance was a red Chevrolet convertible that incidentally people could spot in emergencies and, and know exactly where she was. During the summer of, and fall of 1957, a year after Lawler's poisoning, Dr. Hogan treated many workers in the area for parathion poisoning. Parathion is another organophosphate nerve gas. The air was thick with spray residue. 
While Dr. Hogan might normally see 25 or 30 African-American patients a day, when poisoning seasons began in 1957, it increased to 125 a day. They arrived with high fevers, confused, coughing, and spitting up blood, and would lay out in the yard until she could see them. She diagnosed the illness as organic organophosphate poisoning, treated them with the antidote atropine, and advised her patients to stay away from the fields during spraying. Dr. Hogan reported that people had died of respiratory failure from this chemical. Dr. Hogan went public announcing to the media that parathion was causing health problems. The Public Health Service hastily investigated and concluded the condition was in no way related to the use of insecticides. They did it in one day. Over time, the parathion poisonings were explained as, quote, one of the first outbreaks of Asian flu in Mississippi. Dr. Hogan was still angry in April of, 19, of 2003 when I interviewed her, incredulous that the Public Health Service diagnosed flu when she successfully treated the people with atropine. Dr. Hogan's Glen Allen Clinic was practically surrounded by cotton fields and pesticide mist drifted through the windows. As spraying continued throughout autumn, Dr. Hogan became nauseated and, and experienced, in her words, mental confusion and headaches and a feeling of being mixed up and not being able to say what I want to say. On October 5, 1957, she collapsed and was forced to leave her practice and seek medical attention. She never returned to practice in the Delta. Her experience raises the likelihood of a hidden transcript of poisonings. Other doctors, no doubt, treated uh, poisoning. They read the medical literature in the, uh, the Journal of American Medical Association. They coexisted with planters and no doubt socialized with planters and, and did their jobs but never went public with what was really going on. It's easier to understand why African Americans never complained because, as you know, in the 1950s, it was a time of mechanization, and they did not want to raise any questions that might cause them to lose their jobs. So you can, it's easier to understand. In the summer of 1958, as his health continued to fail and his medical bills mounted, Charles Lawler turned to Drew, Mississippi attorney Pascal Townsend. Townsend was a Sunflower County native, served in World War II, and then established a law practice in Drew. By the way, he was Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer's attorney. Lawler sued landlord V.A. Johnson, tenant Tracy Skelton, and aerial, aerial applicator J.L. Turk for damages. Elizabeth Hewlin, an attorney with the Watkins and Eager firm in Jackson, joined Townsend in the case. Townsend and Hewlin were a formidable team. Hewlin educated herself on medicine and pesticides in preparation for the trial. While Townsend and Hewlin prepared the plaintiff's case, Forrest Cooper constructed a defense for Johnson and for Skelton and Turk. Delta planners were concerned that if Lawler won his case, it might set a precedent for seeking damages. Cooper helped to discredit Lawler, hoped to discredit Lawler's claim of being poisoned and challenged the testimony of the only eyewitness, Johnny McCaleb, an African-American. Expert witnesses would present chemicals as benign. The request for Stoneville's Dr. Marvin Merkel, also a Shell consultant, was part of this strategy. The Delta Council's request for expert testimony from a government scientist connected with Shell and ARS's solicitousness were emblematic of the ties between government scientists and the, the private sector in this time period. The Delta Council's B.F. Smith worked closely with Boswell Stevens, who was head of the Mississippi Farm Bureau Federation, and both were connected, connected to Mississippi State University, the state's white land-grant school, and to the network of county agricultural offices and USDA bureaucrats in every county. As Mississippi cotton production evolved from labor-intensive plowing, chopping, and picking into capital-intensive tractors, pesticides, and picking machines, those who stood to benefit from the emerging system allied to promote their interests. Forrest Cooper assembled a formidable list of expert witnesses to defend agribusiness. Dr. Mitchell R. Zavon was Cooper's star expert. 
He worked at the Kettering Laboratory in Cincinnati and practiced occupational medicine. Ambitious and confident, he boasted a long list of consultantships. When Forrest Cooper asked the geographical, ex geographical extent of Zavon's pesticide expertise, he boldly re replied, it includes the whole world. Mitchell Zavon wore many hats, a role that would eventually raise questions about conflict of interest he had at, in the Department of Agriculture. Dr. Zavon considered himself an expert on agricultural chemicals, including Indrin and Malathion. He denied that aerial spraying was hazardous to humans and testified that there were no cases on record of permanent injury. With organophosphate poisoning, he declared, in his words, they either die right then and there or get well. There's nothing in between. <laughs> For survivors, he proclaimed, there were no after effects. Attorney Elizabeth Hewlin had objected several times during what she considered Forrest Cooper's leading questions. In her cross-examination, she pushed Zavon through complex explanations of toxicity of the chlorinated hydrocarbons and organophosphates, forcing him to admit that malathion and endrin were dangerous pesticides. Zavon had his hands full as he danced around the implications of her interrogation. Expert witness Dr. Griffith E. Quinby, who testified by affidavit, had published a study of chemical health hazards in the Mississippi Delta based on a 10-week investigation he made from June 16th through August 28, 1957. Quinby had briefly visited Glen Allen in the late summer of 1957, the very time that Dr. Hogan was poisoned and there was this epidemic. And he, in his words, I talked, well, he also uh, heard about Charles Lawler. He said, I talked with a physician concerned first on the phone and later went to the area to investigate. Neither in Glen Allen nor in any part of the Delta, Quinby testified, had he discovered any person injured by malathion or injrin. Although Quinby had discussed Charles Lawler's illness with Dr. Aiden, the man who first attended him, it was not mentioned in his report. And he explained that, as he said, because I gave him, Dr. Aiden, my requested opinion that this case was not due to the alleged insecticide exposure and that a far more satisfactory diagnosis surely could be found. Although he spent 10 weeks in the Delta, Quinby did not visit the hundreds of workers around Glen Allen who were complaining of pesticide poisoning. He was strangely uncurious about Dr. Hogan's successful treatment of her patients with atropine and seemed eager to diagnose Charles Lawler long distance based on Dr. Aiden's description. He thus avoided the Glen Allen victims and Lawler, freeing him to minimize pesticide dangers. When Dr. A. A. Aiden took the stand, it was obvious that his testimony would be crucial. When he arrived at Lawler's house on August 17, 1956, he testified, Lawler was complaining of coughing and pain in his chest. And Aiden diagnosed pneumonia. He said he got no treatment for insecticide poison. Under Elizabeth Hewlin's cross-examination, Dr. Aiden had little recollection of what happened on August 17th. When Hewlin asked, you diagnosed it as virus pneumonia, therefore you gave him no atropine, Aiden answered no. Intent on proving that pesticides were harmless, the defense called the county agricultural agent of Sunflower County, several crop duster pilots, some farmers, and had Dr. Marvin Merkel, several planters, and other witnesses ready when the defense rested. To counter the claims that those near chemicals never suffered adverse effects, Pascal Townsend and Elizabeth Hewland put Dr. Mary Elizabeth Hogan on the stand. In her opinion, Lawler's illness resulted from poisoning. When she testified that in August 1957, she treated patients suffering from cotton poisoning, Forrest Cooper objected that Dr. Hogan's testimony was not rebuttal. The judge sustained the objection, preventing her from relating her experiences. Both sides made their closing arguments, 
After four days of testimony and an hour and a half of closing arguments, it took the jury 20 minutes on March 19, 1960, to return a verdict for the defendants. In early April 1960, Townsend and Hewlin appealed the case to the Mississippi Supreme Court. That decision came down May 22, 1961. The court did not accept Forrest Cooper's claim that chemicals were not dangerous. It said it is undisputed that if a person receives an excessive amount of these chemicals, they might be highly toxic and dangerous to human life. They found little evidence or no evidence to dispute that Lawler had been sprayed. Nobody refuted the testimony of Lawler and McCaleb. The court took particular exception to Dr. A. A. Aden's testimony. It reviewed his claim that pesticide poisoning was first mentioned months after Lawler was hospitalized. Quoting the, the decision, the hospital record, however, reflects that on August 17th, he prescribed atropine, the recognized antidote for chemical poisoning. The Supreme Court also ruled that the trial court should have allowed the rebuttal testimony of Dr. Hogan. While landlord V.A. Johnson was cleared, the court ordered a retrial of Skelton and Turk. The case was never retried, either because Townsend and Hewlin thought no Mississippi jury would convict, because Charles Lawler was too weak to go to court, or because Johnny McCaleb was not available to testify. By June 1962, the papers were filed and Tracy Skelton and J.L. Turk settled for $4,599. Charles Lawler lived five more years, passing on June 10, 1967. Even as Skelton and Turk settled in June 1962, the New Yorker carried the first installment of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. By this time, many people had encountered problems with pesticides, and despite constant reassurances from experts and advertisements, they were skeptical that chemicals were benign. Prior to Silent Spring, there were few places for average people to turn for facts on pesticides. Advertisements showed pest-free homes, yards, and fields. Conventional wisdom held that the federal government monitored toxicity, and many people held a Superman attitude toward chemicals. Even employees of the Agriculture Research Service spread false information. In 1957, after a complaint about DDT spraying in rural New York, the Agriculture Research Service's V.E. Weil investigated and was dismayed when he showed up, in his words, that all in the area seemed to be organic farmer enthusiasts. The farm foreman feared that DDT residues might affect the quality of milk. Weil assured him that, quote, the material would break down rapidly in the sun and dissipate. Of course, DDT does not break down rapidly, if at all. Before Weil could leave, in his words, a Miss Burns thrust her way into the room and conversation. Weil observed that she was, quote, a bird enthusiast. And another one of his quotes, an organic garden enthusiast, although she smokes cigarettes. <laughs> so you, you can get an idea here of the kind of investigations that were going on. By this time, most of the country's milk and meat supply contained pesticide residues. Just as Weil misled the farm foreman, the AR ARS repeatedly lied about the toxicity of chemicals used in the gypsy moth, elm bark beetle, and fire ant control programs. And by the way, um, if I don't mention it later, by this time, the country's milk supply and baby food supply had pesticide residues that were illegal that the Department of Agriculture kept the lid on and did not reveal. The Agriculture Research Service derived its power from operating at the intersection of pesticide regulation and use, between approving the chemical industry's formulations and ensuring that foods were not contaminated. I think we might have gotten out of uh, order here. Okay, we'll be to him in a minute. Chemical industry representatives roamed ARS hallways, consulted with staff about labels, about residues, control projects, research, and other issues. 
ARS enforced staff discipline and intimidated any employee who questions its claim that pesticides were benign. Yet the ARS files at Archives 2 bulge with complaints and records of human, domestic animals, fish, and wildlife issues. Cattle seem particularly susceptible to herbicides such as 2,4-D and to both chlorinated hydrocarbons and organophosphates. In 1964, testimony before Senator Abraham Ribicoff's subcommittee of the Committee on Government Operations revealed that a family that lived beside a commercial orchard was continually exposed to chemical drift. Five of the family's horses died, and the family sold the house and moved. It took the woman four years to regain her health. Ever attempting to minimize dangers, chemical advocates relied upon, upon false analogies constructing a benign cloak for, pe for pesticides and for poisons. While ARS bureaucrats often use such tools, Wheeler Macmillan in Bugs or People compiled a definitive glossary. There's one Faulknerian linked sentence in the book I won't quote to you that goes on and on about what insects do. It's in the book. I mean, it's, it's, it, they bite, it's frightening. Uh, but in his book, he also counterattacked Silent Spring. Human life, he boldly observed, seldom proceeds without encountering hazards and dangers of one degree or another. Each year, he pointed out, some 20,000 people in the United States died from falls, quickly adding that twice that number died in automobile accidents. Quoting him, the injuries, impairments, and disabilities from each of these causes far exceeded all the fatalities that can in any way be traced to pesticides. ARS often used false analogies, misinformation, and patronizing language when replying to complaints about pesticides. In his 1962 reply to Michigan resident Barbara Bowling, Assistant Secretary of Agriculture Kenneth Burkhead suggested that automobiles, in his words, automobiles are deadly weapons when misused. And then he mentioned the thousands of people killed each year on the highway. And quoting him again, the same is true about insecticides. The massive and indiscriminate spray campaigns, residues in foods, wildlife destruction, and accidental deaths hardly resembled automobile driving. People chose to drive, realized the risks, and could hone their driving skills. <coughs> Burkhead concluded with a favorite ahistorical theme, suggesting that before synthetic chemicals, the world was at the brink of insect domination. <laughs> Quoting him, the balance of nature always changes, and I'm not sure that I would like to see a return to the days when men cowered in a cave, fought off monsters, and was lucky if he reached the age of 30. His alarming and preposterous claim ignored the long history of pesticide use and demeaned the farmer's knowledge of pest control. A note of desperation crept into the ARS rhetoric, rhetoric after Silent Spring. The ARS's Byron T. Shaw, who you see here, reacted vehemently to Jerome Wisner's draft report to the president on pesticides. Quote, pesticides which rank among the scientific but the significant scientific developments of the century have pushed us far along the road of human progress. Without pesticides, he claimed, quoting him, about 70% of the important crops produced in the United States could not be grown successfully. I'm saying this at a land-grant school. I guess somebody could, could check on that. I've, I'm just quoting these people. Reaching for the proper analogy to damn the report, he claimed that, quote, vital statistics show that accident, accidental fatalities caused by all pesticides annually will about equal those caused by aspirin alone. And while those caused by sleeping tablets are more than, more than two times as many. Such inventive rhetoric, of course, missed the point and employed an innocence by association theme. Even Secretary of Agriculture Orville Freeman uh, claimed in one of his testimonies, the hazards inherent in the use of gas, electricity, and certain patent medicines, for example, certainly outweigh the dangers from the use of pesticides. Abraham Rivikoff held a series of hearings on pesticide dangers, and the, the photograph of Rachel Carson you saw at the beginning was from one of these hearings. 
And the witness list was a who's who of those supporting and those opposing unchecked use of pesticides, from Rachel Carson to Mitchell Zavon. In July 1963, a Vanderbilt University professor of biochemistry tested the chairman's patients when he blithely stated, all substances to which man is exposed or which he consumes have the capacity to produce injury and therefore possess toxicity. He mentioned table salt, oxygen, water, and vitamins, as well as a long list of naturally occurring chemicals. Household accidents with pesticides, he continued, were the same as those related to salt, gasoline, kerosene, lye, aspirin, sleeping pills, and so forth. Household accidents with pesticides were like automobile accidents, he suggested, and despite 500 auto deaths over the past July 4th weekend, no one advocated banning cars. Ribicoff observed that automobiles were strictly regulated and drivers licensed. He labeled the professor's argument an invidious comparison. Top ARS managers defended pesticides and coddled chemical company lobbyists. Uh, Silent Spring raised enough questions of ARS culpability that Secretary of Agriculture Orville Freeman briefly distanced himself from chemical companies, even refusing to speak at chemical conventions. Park Brinkley, head of the National Agricultural Chemicals Association, had testified to pesticide safety before the Ribicoff Committee and was miffed that Freeman no longer publicly embraced pesticides. Even as chemical companies stepped up advertising and attempted to discredit Rachel Carson, they pressured the agriculture department to defend pesticides. The chemical industry also played hardball, intimidating ARS bureaucrats, inserting their own experts into the pesticide regulation division, Mitchell Zavon was one of those, and stubbornly refusing to take dangerous products off the market or even alter the labels to warn of dangers to children or to older people. While most reports of toxicity bounced off slick advertisements, ARS files, newspaper stories, court cases, congressional hearings, and other sources document a depressing trail of poisonings. Two physicians released a study that showed from 1959 through 1964, there were 56 deaths in Florida traced to parathion. 30 of them children. Nine people died from malathion poisoning. Bill Robinette, a crop duster who worked in Arizona, Mexico, and Canada, wrote a frank autobiography by the skin of my teeth, giving a vivid description of organophosphates. And of course, one of these, he was one of these uh, flat out pilots and tells some wonderful stories. It's a fascinating book. And he said, concerning parathion, there is no such thing as a bad job with parathion because it killed horses, cattle, dogs, fowl, and pilots. Robinette told a chilling story about his narrow escape. He said, pass after pass, load after load, things became increasingly foggy. He had uh, sprayed himself a, a day before when he was, he was filling up the, the hopper in the plane at the nozzle, he got distracted and the nozzle went out and it sprayed some on him and he washed it off but he didn't change clothes and do what he should have and he, uh, the next day this is what he felt like. He was, became increasingly foggy. At lunch he unsuccessfully tried to sleep, he was too nervous to sleep. He was afraid to admit that he was too sick to fly, he said, for fear of the usual sneers and snide remarks about being afraid of the airplane. He was supposed to fly that afternoon, but fortunately it was too windy and he couldn't, they couldn't apply pesticides with that much wind. And he said when his brother found him that afternoon, all I could discern was a distant and remote conversation. It was like all activity was taking place in another dimension. And he added, it was atropine time. <laughs> While Robinette actually knew about pesticide dangers, and had seen friends crash after being overcome by pesticides, many people had scanty knowledge of pesticide toxicity. Robinette told the story of a man who walked home through a field that had been sprayed that day with parathion. He went to sleep and never woke up. In a North Carolina 1969 and 70 study of how farmers used, stored, and regarded pesticides, it turned out that they kept most chemicals in the house, close to the house, or in unlocked sheds nearby. 
only 14% of them locked up the, these really toxic chemicals. They discarded empty bags and other containers in fields. Um, urban people were even more careless, putting them under the sink and in cabinets and so forth. Just this total disregard for, they didn't read the labels, they didn't understand that if children get into these things, it would be horrible. They, they could be sickened or, or killed. I took, took these pictures about 15 years ago in Dixie, Georgia. And these are Folex uh, containers, just the one on the left. Or Fol I didn't take the one on the right. The one on the left is Folex containers, and the other one's from the Department of Agriculture, just looking at discarded containers. While household and agricultural chemicals were visible, many people bought homes that had been soil poisoned for termites. A Georgia businessman estimated that in 1968, some 40,000 Georgia homes had been treated with 4.1 million pounds of chlordane. The prescribed amount was 103 pounds per house. Since 1955, he discovered some 438,000 Georgia homes had been so poisoned. Now, moving a little closer to the present, in June 1987, there was a congressional hearing on banning chlordane under houses. Congressman Tom DeLay complained that the session was weighted toward those who want to ban chlordane. Henry Waxman reminded the Texas congressman that Dow, Shell, Terminex, Terminex, and other chemical companies had not accepted the invitation to testify. DeLay compared the move to ban pesticides to one that would, quote, outlaw automobiles and claimed that aspirin is a health ha hazard when misapplied. Obviously, there is a certain thing people say in these situations. He dismissed the 0.3% cancer rate of people living in homes treated by chlordane as insignificant, until Waxman reminded him that the percentage translated into 300,000 people at risk. Then DeLay labeled the statement inflammatory and continued to defend chlordane. There are just lots and lots of cases of chlordane poisoning in the ARS files. And when I was opening an exhibit in Helena, Arkansas some years ago, and this woman asked what I was working on, and I told her pesticides, she told a harrowing story of how her uh, house was poisoned, and uh, the person actually applied the chlordane in the house. She said the next morning they, the whole family was in the emergency room in Memphis, uh, almost at the point of death. But she, she said... She, she said my Bible still smells like chlordane. After World War II, synthetic pesticides stampeded across the land with scant toxicity research and shaky directions for use. The ARS's Pesticide Regulation Division, tucked into the mammoth USDA and hidden by the ARS, became the nerve center of the country's pesticide regulation policy and registration policy. Despite its crucial public health mission, the, pub, uh, the Pesticide Regulation Division, which I'll abbreviate PRD, operated behind closed doors where a chorus of eager corporate re registrants drowned out concern for pesticide safety. Malfeasance and perfidy allowed a percentage of more than 40, 45,000 products containing 900 different chemical compounds to gain access to and remain on the market mislabeled, not fully tested, and dangerous. Had chemical companies written the legislation, staffed the PRD, and dictated crucial decisions, their influence on research, regulation, and label policy would not have been more absolute. The public simply was not aware of the labyrinthian and flawed process that supposedly protected them. PRD approved pesticide labels and worked closely, some claim too closely, with the big chemical companies. Although synthetic chemicals had been on the market for nearly a quarter century, Labels continued to confuse people with small print, large words, and contradictory directions. PRD's solution was a 1969 contract with the University of Illinois for a follow-up to a previous study by the University of Wisconsin that showed many users could not understand labels. When the Illinois study came in, the head of PRD said they would hire an advertising agency to design sample labels and then sit down with the chemical companies and ARS personnel to construct final label copy. 
I mean, I hope you realize this is extremely convoluted and not meant to help anybody. Leaving faulty labels on the market could be serious, even deadly. I don't have a picture of Jose Gonzalez, but here is his pilot's licenses. In August of 1961, Gonzalez, a crop duster from Mexico, who was working his way through medical school in California, was spraying Folex in Lee County, South Carolina. The Folex bag had no skull and crossbones or antidote for the poison. On his third trip of the day, and, and here's the, the map, Crop dusters are very thorough in, in plotting out what they're doing every day because they have to be aware of the phone lines and everything else in their way. So this was the map he had. On the third trip that day, Gonzalez suddenly became nauseated, short of breath, had stomach cramps, soft spots, and lost coordination. He clipped a wire, flipped, and landed upside down with the hopper content spilled all over him. There were some field workers nearby, and they called an ambulance, and he arrived in the, in the hospital. And the physician treated him for a broken leg and lacerations and all the other things that he damaged himself with until finally, it, until the physician noted that he was, he was going. I mean, he was losing his vital signs and so forth. And he realized he'd been poisoned, but the bag, the label didn't give any information on how to treat a patient. And he spent some time that day trying to find out how to do that while trying to keep the patient alive. And finally he realized that the, the basis of, of the folex was an organophosphate, so he administered atropine and saved Gonzalez's life. But meanwhile, he wasn't able to set his leg for some time, and he ended up with a permanently injured leg and, and stayed in the hospital for a month and a half, returned to Mexico, then he went back to California to resume his medical studies and realized he, was, he had disabilities because of this, and he sued the chemical company that put out this product. And he uh, sued them successfully. But you might be interested in what the attorney for the chemical company suggested as he set out his case. We propose to show that the toxicity of this material, the attorney claimed, is about in the range of aspirin, perhaps a little more so. Everything is toxic, even water, under certain conditions. Uh, there was another expert witness who had been in the Special Forces, and uh, he was a South Carolinian, and he'd studied how to kill people. He's, and in his testimony, he said, this is the very thing we were trained to kill people with. <laughs> so the whole... Uh, Gonzalez won his case and got uh, judgment. Another South Carolina case involved Edward V. Griffin, who during inventory in a warehouse that held pesticides, accidentally had a bag of parathion break. He washed himself off as the label warned, went home for dinner, collapsed, was taken to the hospital, administered atropine, but died anyway. His widow successfully sued the chemical company for, again, putting out a product with an inadequate label. One good thing about working in legal sources is, is that you find some of the documents I've been showing you. you. This is the actual warehouse, the actual bag of, of parathion that broke uh, before those licenses were in the evidence of the trial. So it's, it's really amazing when you can find things like that. And these are actual Lindane vaporizer uh, boxes, and I think the, the vaporizers were still in them. They were in evidence files at the National Archives in the EPA papers. So the Pesticide Regulation Division also allowed dangerous products to remain on the market. <coughs> Excuse me. Lindane vaporizers fill the air of houses and restaurants with an invisible vapor that killed flies and other insects, but that also left residues on surfaces and food. Lindane could sicken or kill people, as ARS files amply demonstrate, but the Agricultural Research Service refused to remove Lindane vaporizers from the market. Two government accounting office studies and a congressional hearing 
reveal a disgraceful record of incompetence by the Pesticide Regulation Division. The House report concluded that the PRD, quote, had failed almost completely to carry out its responsibility. And then it listed that it had failed to enforce pesticide laws, including never bringing a single criminal prosecution despite remarkable offenses, approving products over the, uh, over the objection of HEW, permitting products that adulterated food to remain on the market, failing to demand clear labels, refusing to cancel registration of dangerous products, and tolerating conflicts of interest. The records of the PRD, by the way, were not forwarded to the National Archives. And I could not locate them at the EPA or in any part of the Department of Agriculture. They seem to have disappeared. So fortunately, the GAO reports and the congressional hearing pulled back the, the cloak that had protected them for so long so you can get in and understand what was going on. The, I, don't, I never found any evidence that the people involved in this had any introspection. There's no, none of this in the public record. The complexity of agricultural chemicals, the power of advertising to mask dangers, and misplaced trust in federal regulatory agencies engendered public apathy about pesticides and other potentially harmful products. While the environmental movement showed the chemical treadmill, slowed the chemical treadmill, the struggle over regulation and safety continues. The rapid spread of synthetic pesticides after World War II embodied claims that scientific intervention would ensure better health and wholesome food. To a large extent, this claim was fulfilled. Still, evidence of pesticide residues, unlabeled genetically modified foods, unease over mad cow disease, over nanotechnology dangers, and disturbing reports of continuing pesticide dangers alarm consumers. A history of misuse, mislabeling, and misleading statements has undermined trust in regulatory agencies. Swirling chlorinated hydrocarbon residues from a half century ago endanger Arctic Circle human and animal life. No computer model can accurately predict the impact that genetically engineered fish, animals, and plants will have on their natural counterparts, or for that matter, on human health and the environment. What amounts to premature adoption of new products has been a constant, a constant since at least World War II. The corporate compulsion to market first, test later, and resist regulation has left a legacy of widespread sickness and death. Corporate lobbyists continually refine tools that manipulate politicians, and agribusiness inexorably has its way with regulators. Environmentalists gain a few steps with one administration and lose them with the next. The pesticide wreckage generated in the quarter century after World War II is thus a cautionary history. In an era that began with Hiroshima and progressed through nuclear testing, radiation experiments, ARS control projects, marketing of poorly tested and inadequately labeled pesticides, Vietnam defoliation with Agent Orange, corporate pesticide dumping, and the creation of toxic waste zones, it is not difficult to imagine chemical companies and their political and bureaucratic allies giving a higher priority to the death of insects than to the health of humans. Thank you. I'd try to any I'll try to answer some questions if you have any. Yes. Um, I like to talk a lot. Um, and I realize that your you know your your subject is really the, the regulatory agency and its um, lack of responsibility or, or lack of whatever. But my question has to do with that aspirin that keeps coming back. Because it seems like a very um, crude attempt at risk assessment. And risk assessment is something that people do all the time when they assess whether the benefits of something outweigh you know, the, the negatives, assuming we even know what those are, assuming they have been 
um, made public. And I'm just wondering if you could talk about that. Not, not so much, you know, the aspirin is ludicrous, but what about, you know, people coming from schools of public policy who are doing sophisticated risk analysis on things like pesticides? I'm not an expert on risk assessment on purpose. I think if you're one of the people who are going to survive the risk, you'll be in favor of risk assessment. If you're one of the people that are not going to survive, you would be against it. But I think calculating human, uh, human life and death on, on the basis of profit is something that I just I don't, I can't go along with. I don't know that you have to. It's never been proven to me that you, you have to sacrifice people uh, in, in this situation. benefits of it will outweigh that. So yeah, it's bad for you if you eat it, like salmon, right? I, you know, do we eat salmon? Do we not eat salmon? We're going to get heavy metals, but on the other hand, you know, I have to have it for my heart or something. And that's, that's home grown stuff. And I think that's the risk assessment that happens on the basis of, you know, public science, uh, ordinary science. Yeah, well, I think if a consumer is given the information that, that what the danger is, then the, the consumer makes that decision. I like to eat fish. You know, fish has got mercury or whatever else in it. Well, you like fish, and you're hoping that you're not going to be one of the people that has an accumulation that's dangerous to you. But it's the information. It, it, like, we lack information on what's genetically modified. Why? Don't we need that information if we have some problem with it? Or it's like we, we have gotten a lot better about labeling things. And I, I was walking through a, the, the, a garden store the other day just looking at labels, which I had not done in a long time. And, and, and so many of the products had malathion. Okay. And most people, that means nothing to most people. They don't know what it is. But it's there on the label. So if you educate yourself, you'll know what you're buying. But not many people really do. And people still don't read labels. But um, I don't know if I answered your question or not. No, I don't. Even when they know that it has people have a right to make a choice, but if they, if they have the information, uh, we're always choosing against our best interest. I mean, I'm not very confident that we all don't do that. I certainly do. I mean, I love ice cream, for example, and I <laughs> I would not dare to read the label. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, that's oversimplified. I'm sorry. assessment that <coughs> comes through crystal clear. Um, to take the Agricultural Research Service as an example, since you seem to have an abundance of evidence in that case, how do you explain, again, this complicity? Is it possible, for example, on the basis of the research that you've done, to not simply imply that there seemed to be a relationship there between the industry and the agency, but to actually well, the most egregious of, of the things I ran across was the one that concerned Dr. Zavon, and it concerned uh, there there was a, a con there was a one gentleman in the agri in the pesticide regulation division who they were arguing that there was a product called, I think it was Zapona. It was a, like a, a, a thing that also gave off some uh, <laughs> invisible vapors. And Shell wanted it on the market. And this guy kept arguing that it should be on the market while he was an employee of the Pesticide Regulation Division. And then as he, he was hired by Shell, and he continued to make that argument and went over to Shell and made that argument for them, and he had inside access. Dr. Zavon was put on committees in the Pesticide Regulation Division. He was a, cons a Shell consultant also. And so these people basically had either worked from within and then joined Shell or represented Shell and came in. And 
there was one other person I can't remember right now who there was three people who were basically charged with conflict of interest violations in the late 60s, none of whom, as far as I could find out, were convicted of anything, even though some of the cases were passed to, to the Justice Department. But it seemed that from the correspondence between Shell and other companies and the ARS, it just appeared that the corporations had total access to the, to the top bureaucrats in PRD and ARS. And that uh, Park Brinkley, for example, was, was ruthless in writing letters and demanding things out of the PRD. And the Shell people would write and say, how dare you try to ban these chemicals, especially when chlorinated hydrocarbons were being banned in the late 60s and early 70s. The, the amount of pressure coming from the chemical company was enormous. That they kept insisting, uh, one, of, one favorite thing that I didn't mention is they kept insisting that more studies needed to be made. That you haven't proven yet that these are, are toxic to, to people. And our studies show this. Well, all the other studies have shown something else. And, and with Dr. Zivon's studies on pest strips, his, where the evidence was sent the first time, showed no problem. But, but where it was taken the next time did. So you have the, the corporations shaping the research to their own ends, which they still do, of course. But it's, it's all there in the records. There's correspondence between Shell and the ARS, and th there's the whole uh, hearing that L.H. Fountain's subcommittee did on just the total ineptness of the bureaucrats and the, the conflicts of interests. So it's just a, it's a, it's a big record. I mean, I didn't make it a major part of what I was doing, but it's there. Yes. I really don't know that any African Americans were, were wrapped up in the pesticide debate. I mean, Dr. Hogan treated a lot of people, but I think that most African American farmers and sharecroppers at that time were in, involved in other issues, like Mrs. Hamer. And uh, at that time, the late 50s, it was after Brown v. Board, and then in 1960, you had the sit-ins and, and the founding of SNCC, but as far as Sunflower County, it was probably later on when Sunflower County became very active in the civil rights movement. So, but, but of course, you, you had, my reference was to the incredible transformation that was going on in agriculture. You had formerly in, in the cotton culture in the Delta, you had people who had to do the plowing in the spring and who had to do chopping the weeds out in the summer and who had to do the cotton picking in the fall and it took an enormous amount of people to do that. And then when you get first tractors, and then you develop the picking machine, and then you have the herbicides and the chemicals come in, then you need very few people. And all these agricultural workers were unemployed. There were tractor drivers and machine drivers and a few other people around the plantations where you had a dozen people where you used to have 200. And so people, a lot of people were migrating out of the area. Other people were trying to survive as best they could with part-time work or with, uh, with welfare payments. And ironically, even as they were trying to subsist on whatever scraps they could get off the table, the big planters like James Eastland, who was a senator, were making enormous amounts of money from federal subsidies, which was welfare. And yet they were condemning the black people who had been thrown off their plantations and were trying to survive. Does that help a little bit? Okay. Outside, and I'm not talking if somebody uses it in the house, which is not my sister, but 
So I, I, I'm sorry that Nullifyam is so prominent because there's so many other <laughs> better examples. Well, the reason I, I brought it up was because of the Lawler case, and he was unfortunate. Nobody ever studied the potentiation of those chemicals, well, yeah, which was, yeah, yeah. But but uh, even if if either chemical either chemical were benign, and even the xylene was benign, if you mix them, nobody knew what the effect was, and. Plus the, the circumstances of that. So uh, obviously the EPA wouldn't allow all these things on the market if it were that. I, th I think the EPA is better than the PRD was. Yeah. yeah. I've been assured by people I know at EPA that they're doing a better job because they've talked to me about this. Yes. I don't really know the answer to that. I've heard that we bake DDT and, and ship it out, but I've never done any research on it. Does anybody know? Yes, we make, we make them, we export them, we don't allow them to be used here, but we make them and export them, yes. Uh, Jimmy Carter tried to stop that, and then as soon as Reagan came into office, he reversed it uh, with a ban on that sort of thing. Yes. Yeah, I well, I mean, I'm an entomologist here, and I think it's kind of interesting when people are bashing the DDT and these peripheries, but, but you seem to forget it, just the benefits of it. If you go to the uh, African nations, uh, the only way they control malaria and to reduce the loss of 2 million children a year is the use of DDT. And there's all sorts of the talk about alternatives, but when talking about DDT, you're talking about the cheap, inexpensive, it's still a, fair, a very effective compound for controlling mosquitoes, uh, to them, to them, it's a benefit. And they were thinking of banning it. Uh, they were very hard up saying you've got to ban this because uh, children's death from the lack of well, malaria and not the mosquito, and the babies and mosquitoes uh, is going to have a significant impact. I mean, but the benefits of DDT, and I'm not an advocate of DDT, if it was came about from titers. I mean, if it wasn't for DDT, World War II could have been different because the typhus epidemics, especially in Italy, were having a tremendous impact on soldier mortality. Um, so that's one point. The other thing is, it's very easy for us to come back from a perspective now to evaluate, yes, DDT did have some negative effects. Uh, but back then, the technology and the rules and regulations were just out of an effort for us to evaluate as carefully as we do now. But now with the FQPA, and the revaluation of many of these, we can go back. But back then, built the technology and our sense of understanding were not even there. Well, what happened in this country and in England was that the residues were, were killing wildlife, and that was, as I think, as much of an issue that you're destroying wildlife. And of course, the, the, the cycle, I mean, I, I appreciate what you say about the health in Africa and all, but, but the residues from those chemicals that were used in the 50s are still with us, and they're poisoning the Arctic, which is where the stuff is ending up now. And again, you make a decision. Is, is uh, the health of people in Africa more important than this other long-range effect? But the fact is that in the 50s, Pesticides were applied in this country out of all proportion to what anybody with common sense would have suggested. And you could just take the fire ant campaign as one example, where they used heptachlor and um, dildren and other very powerful chlorinated hydrocarbons and sprayed those over the whole south. Your proper, you could not say you didn't want to be sprayed. They sprayed everything and they killed uh, animals and everything else underneath them as they did it, and it was unnecessary. They were not going to eradicate fire ants. And the, the entomologists who really understood ants and whatever told them that you're not gonna be able to eradicate fire ants. But they continued with the program, and they even came back in the 60s and used Myrex, another chlorinated hydrocarbon, on a second fire ant war that everybody said again is misdirected and is gonna be unsuccessful, which it was. 
and I joke, almost joke, that the fire ant became strengthened by this, that learned, built up resistance to all these chemicals and developed into a super fire ant and, uh, you know, we'll con conquer the world. If we keep spraying them, you know, that we're, we're going to create this monster. But I say that jokingly because it's, it's so much like a 50s movie where you have the insect dominance and all. But I think it, you, you pointed out it's a, it's a very complicated thing, and I appreciate that. Toxicologists too, and I've trained a number of them, and I've seen how the toxicology ecology community kind of works over the years. And people in industry uh, tend to get a lot of internal reinforcement, and they feel beleaguered that their compound is unjustly accused. And sometimes the the effects are exaggerated, and and, and other times. Uh, though they, they really want to ignore the effects and they play them down ad nauseum to excess, in, in my experience. Um, in the case of DDT and malaria, um, it's, yeah, DDT can save some folks, uh, but there are other alternatives that we don't find economic ways to <coughs> implement. And if we were willing to do that, we could help those folks without the downsides. Of, of DDT, but the, the amounts of DDT being used these days in the tropics really small compared to what we used to use all over the place, and there and there is some degradation of the pesticide over time in the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, it's significant, but you're right. We are still eroding the globe with some of the, the polar areas with some of the more persistent organochlorines. The complexity of these issues is what gives people like me a job. <laughs> and, uh, and it's going to be true into the future with other pesticides that are coming on the market now, which tend to be more potent in, to the target, less uh, persistent in the environment, uh, but also less, their effects tend to be less well publicized in the literature. Mm. And so there's sort of a greater unknown in, in, in a way that concerns me. But you go back to to malathion, and, and, and yeah, it's one of the least toxic OPs, but there are holes in the literature that are wide open, things we, that have never been studied to this day. And to me, that's a, that's a disgrace, because they've made so much money on that compound, they could have easily done a, a greater body of, of research and, and generated important answers to questions that remain open after all these years. I appreciate your comments, and I appreciate the audience's attention. Thank you very much.